Recording from the Sunshine City, St. Petersburg, Florida, overlooking beautiful Tampa Bay, this is the Sonography Lounge, sponsored by Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute. This podcast is dedicated to medical professionals and patients around the world interested in diagnostic and interventional ultrasound. Our podcast will discuss everything ultrasound, from news, trends, career paths, new technology, and industry updates. Hosted by Lori Green and Tricia Rio of Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute, they bring over four decades of experience in the ultrasound profession and are here to guide you through this journey. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy. All right, so we're going to start off, um, you know, speaking about the ASAP ultrasound guidelines and how those influence how we use ultrasound in the emergency room department and the critical care department. So, Dr. Boehner, why don't you start off by by telling us a little bit of history about the ASAP guidelines and where those came from? Well, thanks for having me. I've been doing ultrasound for over near 30 years, and I think that back in 1999, the AMA came up with a resolution said that each specialty needs to define their own scope of practice and that each individual needs to apply for privileging at their own credentialing office. And so there's 24 or 25 medical specialties, and emergency medicine took that charge. We got a group of individuals together, and so in 2001, through the ASAP board, they developed a ASAP ultrasound guidelines that had seven indications, cardiac aorta, trauma, procedures, renal, pregnancy and biliary. They made a white paper out of that and so it really defined the scope of practice. I don't know that all the other specialties really define the scope of practice as clearly. In 2008 they updated that because new information had come along and they updated those with musculoskeletal, thoracic, vascular, and ocular. And then in 2016 they added bowel and hemodynamic monitoring. I think we're here because in 2023 they just updated the guidelines and they put regional anesthesia as part of the core um, ultrasound applications that need to be um, taught. And I think this is really helpful because it evolves as we try to figure out what the practice of the scope of practice and it, it changes. And regional anesthesia has been so important and I think it's, it's, it's really exciting to talk about that today. But the guidelines are really an um, offshoot of the AMA really challenging all the specialties to say, define your own scope of practice of what you want to do with ultrasound. And I think all the other medical specialties should really do that as far as put a yeah. white paper as what you need to do to train your residents and future providers and providing care. So um, applaud ASAP for doing this and continuing the, the leadership that emergency medicine has done with point of care ultrasound. Yeah, I mean, who knows better what you all need than you guys. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And ultrasound has expanded so much among multiple different specialty practices, and each one has its own specific needs and gaps that it needs to fill, so their utilization of ultrasound may be slightly different. So that's that's perfect that the guidelines have been established. Yeah. And you, you know, Dr. Lautenbach, you brought it to our attention, um, I don't know, about a year ago oh, that you. there was some uh, changes in the residency guidelines. So can you speak to a little bit about what that has looked like as far as the uh, re- regional anesthesia and the incorporation into residency programs? Well, yeah, with these uh, recommendation changes from ASAP that's influencing what residencies are teaching to their learners, the residents. And so now residency programs are beginning to figure out how to incorporate regional anesthesia into their training programs and you know I think it's I think it's great I I think that really there's a lot of room to grow in emergency medicine and our ability to both teach and perform regional anesthesia yeah right well I'm sure that the opioid crisis has definitely been been a strong driving force and Mm -hmm. trying to advance the knowledge base of the providers for utilizing methods that are able to address patient pain, which is real, um, without having to use opioids. So maybe you can talk a little bit about your experiences and what you have utilized in the past, how you're working with that in your own practices. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a little bit of a challenge because Emergency departments, we're open 24-7, and most patients come, and one of their most com- common complaints is pain, whether mm-hmm. it's chest pain, abdominal pain, pelvic pain. And um, I was trained in the 20th century, and they used to talk about oligoanalgesia, where you weren't giving enough pain medications, and then they started talking about pain as the fifth vital sign. 
the JCHO was really talking about that, that we weren't treating pain effectively. And part of that was um, really encouraging people to treat pain, and that's important. But the flip side of that is that there were a lot of, there's not a lot of options for pain medications. You have some anti-inflammatories, Tylenol, um, some non-opioid analgesics that are limited, but then you had opioids, and so treating pain was giving a lot of opioids and, and treating that. That has then now turned around because there were a lot of people that became addicted. There are a lot of patients that were um, abusing the pain medication that became addicted because of some um, pain medications that were started. I don't know that emergency medicine was the cause of a lot of the opioid epidemic, yeah, but it was part of the absolutely. part of the issue. Right. And so having options of treating people's pain, which is real, with other things rather than opioid pharmacology, things like regional anesthesia, it's uh, it's it's just really important. And so I think that anesthesiology has really pioneered a lot of regional anesthesia, and now with ASEP recognizing this and becoming one of the core uh, fundamental things that we're training our residents, I think it's really going to be um, exciting to see how we can treat pain without opioids, but do some of these various nerve blocks that I think can really help. And it can be win-win, but I think that this is a skill that I don't know that a lot of people outside of anesthesiology know about just yet. Right. And there are some leaders within emergency medicine who have been pioneering this, but I think it's, it's, it's time has come, and I think that we need to embrace this. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah, I absolutely agree. We, we've all seen these patients come in in arrest after overdosing on opioids, and it's terrible. And so many of them got started because of just developing dependence after being prescribed pain meds. And, you know, it's something that I want to try to minimize my my responsibility for causing any patients to have a bad outcome like that. And so mm-hmm. I've really dug in a lot and have started utilizing regional anesthesia wherever I, I can to be able to provide both great pain control, uh, oftentimes far superior to what I can provide by just giving opioids, but at the same time avoid giving those opioids and, and starting that, uh, that risk to the patient. Right. Can you touch on some of the areas where you fi- have found in your own clinical experience where the nerve blocks, ultrasound guided nerve blocks, have been really beneficial and your patient satisfaction um, after ex- having that? Maybe they've previously had you know opioid treatment and now you've offered the nerve blocks and and how those outcomes have been. With- I think that uh, there's a the the number of nerve blocks has increased as far as what you can do mm-hmm. and I think people's comfort. But I think that for the elderly person that has a hip fracture in doing the fascia iliacus block or things like that, that you don't want to um, cause them to become delirious or hypotense or with giving systemic opioids, the doing a, a nerve block after you're doing a good uh, neurovascular exam of the extremity, that's one. Doing chest tubes and a serratus interior block. I think a lot of these are really interesting because they're not specific nerves, but they're plane blocks. And mm-hmm. if you can get the the uh, regional anesthesia in a plane and it spreads, and one that's really exciting is the erector spinae plane block. That yes. is, but again, I think that we need more experience. I think that from what I, I've heard some recent lectures that that's only been around since about 2016, and mm-hmm. not many people have been doing those. And I think that this is going to be really important for our patient population to have other options besides systemic opioids as an option for their real pain that they're having. But those are some examples that that we have used. Yeah, Yeah, I can think of a couple specific patients that I've seen recently with the same painful chronic condition. I'm not going to go into specifics Mm -hmm. of the details of that condition, but where I've come in, they have been awaiting admission with with repeated opioid doses. And for both of them, I was able to offer them an erector spinae plane block and both agreed to it and both saw near total resolution of their pain and were able to discharge home with no further opioid pain medication requirement. And I I see patients like that really quite frequently. And that's Part of the thing I love about it is they're super happy. It makes me feel good. It feels so much better to actually take care of someone's problem as opposed to just 
kind of cover it up with with the pain meds and and have them admitted for more of the pain meds. So I I think it's a win win for the patient and myself. I I think yeah. I walk out of those rooms just feeling such a high. <laughs> Yeah. Well, in that situation, I mean, we're talking about these nerve blocks. So for somebody who may not know, how long does this anal analgesic effect take? Like, how long is it? does it go on for? Sure. So, well, we can talk about onset and, and right. duration of action. And so onset for a lot of these regional anesthesia procedures, at least in my experience, seems to be in the 15 to 30 minutes for for complete onset or for fairly a thorough quickly. effect. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's fairly quickly. But again not right away. And if you don't warn the patient, they might feel like you failed them. Or if you're going to do a procedure mm -hmm. and especially if you, like I work with residents and, and the residents aren't aware, they might think that the regional anesthesia failed because they attempt the procedure too soon okay. after, after giving it. So generally though, it, it seems like around 15 to 30 minutes uh, before they have a really good effect. And depending on your anesthetic, seems like in the 12 to 16 hours range yeah. is oftentimes uh, what what I am seeing using fairly large volume uh, okay. injections. All right. That's pretty good. Well, I know That's I've it. heard from some of our participants from past courses that they feel that nerve blocks are intimidating. Um, you know, they're maybe new to ultrasound and this seems like a really advanced skill to them. So what can you offer to our listeners who are wanting to incorporate nerve block, but maybe feeling a little intimidated by it? Well, it's like everything else. It's a skill set. And I think that it needs to become more mainstream because again, everybody's talking about the opioid epidemic, mm -hmm. not just emergency physicians, not only Absolutely. medicine, right. but without, before there was actually that pandemic, there has been an opioid epidemic for years before mm -hmm. the, right. the last pandemic and it's continuing and pain is not going away. And so I think that as we evolve as a society, we need to figure out how to treat pain because it's important because I think pain has some long-term effects on people's brain and how they're, they're, they're functioning. And so it's important for our patients, and we're all going to be patients. And so for those learners that are, know our, already how to use ultrasound to identify anatomy, a lot of these are really interesting because they're either the, the nerves will follow vascular structures um, that you can find, but the, the more important ones are the plane blocks that, um, especially that erector spinae block, which what I really like is because it has a bony backstop on the posterior portion of the spine, so there's not a lot of danger to it. Mm -hmm. And so there are some of those that are, there's some of the more dangerous than others that are next to vascular structure, and that's why anesthesiologists are, are, are so good at those. And I can see how those can be intimidating, like an infraclavicular block. But there's others that, like the serratus anterior and then the erector spinae, that I think are plane blocks that you get in the right muscle plane and then the anesthetics spreads and I think that you get a good result. Mm -hmm. So it's like a skill like everything else and in our armaterm we don't have a lot of pharmacologic options and this is another one um, that I think can be used as a procedure but I think that they can learn this just like they can learn other ultrasound skills. Mm -hmm. And it's a skill that you can grow over time. You can start out by doing a median nerve block mm -hmm. by doing an erector spinae plane block or another one of the blocks that are relatively safe, no vascular structures right next to them uh, and, and relatively easy access. And as you become comfortable with that, it's really easy to translate that skill of the needle guidance of the either watching the anesthetics around the nerve or to open up that fascial plane. And really just hearing... At some point, you get to the point where just hearing about and seeing a nerve block described, you can do it without having to ever watch someone do it. You don't need someone to teach you. You can say, oh, that's where I need to go. That's my target. I can find that. Yeah. If I can find it, I can put a needle by it and, and inject the anesthetic. Yeah, especially and if you're already doing some sort of needle-guided procedure like central access. Absolutely. And you, 
it, it might take time to get there, but starting with those those blocks that are less intimidating and working mm-hmm. up both your skill and confidence, I think you can get there and really make a lot of great use of it. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a good absolutely. Point. Yeah. I mean, it's just like anything else that you're starting out. I mean, if you think of all the applications that you utilize in emergency medicine using ultrasound, that you know, if you tried to learn them all at once, which many places do and we incorporate it into our intro course because that's part of the core applications you know in the ultrasound guidelines but um, if you're just starting out and you you don't want to get too overwhelmed you maybe start with vascular access or you just start with the fast exam and so like you said just starting out with forearm nerves or you know like the erector spinae or some of the planar and then as you become more conf- confident, then you can expand it. We did, um, I'm trying to think when it was, but we did actually um, worked with the residency program over in, over in uh, Tampa at USF and with the residents. And we did a hands-on skills training and they did some didactic and they started them out with the forearm nerves. And we worked with them to see, you know, what was the learning curve for just learning forearm nerves and that's what they started with and and so then from there then they graduated on to learning other other nerve blocks and I think <coughs> if if you take it in little bits and pieces like with anything else that's a little complicated because nerves or nerve blocks can be a little more advanced um, like anything else though the more you practice the better you get the more confident you become so you know that's but you do you need the training for it right mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but yeah. you make a good point, and I think that these some of these skill sets that we're already teaching can be then applied to mm-hmm. nerve blocks. Mm-hmm. Guiding the needle to a target is important, and we right. talked about um, how that can be not only for vascular access, but some of these other procedures, whether it's thoro or paracentesis. And I think getting comfortable with that skill of using ultrasound as a window into the body and then guiding the needle to the target, it just what's new is what are the nerves, what are the planes mm-hmm. that we're looking at, what can be effective for these different pain, pain complexes. And that's why um, I've been a, a proponent of putting this in the medical schools because you train people in the medical school for some basic skills, then they turn into residents that feel comfortable with the, the techniques, and then they can then specialize, and then they can become attendings that feel comfortable. And so everything is about practice, and I think the earlier you start. And so I think this is a great uh, move by ASAP because it is important to try to put it in the core, and so hopefully this will be a stimulus for more learners to start using the these very effective ways of treating pain that we see every day. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, would you say that, you know, there's obviously various types of equipment out there. Would you say that this is an application that is equipment dependent, meaning do you have to have a certain type of system in order to be able to visualize the nerves well? Or would you say you can see a nerve on any system? I would say to a very limited extent, it's system dependent. So you need to have the right transducers. You need to have a a transducer that's capable of seeing a needle at the depth you're going. So if you're planning on doing erector spinae plane blocks on patients that tend to um, be above average weight, which half of patients are, (laughs) Uh uh, you need a machine that is able to see a needle that deep. So having a good curvilinear probe that has good needle visualization settings. That being said, most machines out there nowadays are e- well equipped to do this. So right. yeah. the bar is not very high right. to get into this. Yeah, The technology is great now. The other thing that's happening now are vendors and artificial intelligence. I've seen mm-hmm. some prototypes of some different equipment that is able to color code and label different act. Uh, structures and then needle guidance has been used for vascular access and I think that those same kind of technology could be used toward nerve blocks and so I think that the technology is going to continue to increase and kind of um, lower that threshold making it intimidating for a user of identifying the nerves obviously with ultrasound if you're 90 degrees to your target you're going to get the best visualization and why it's so operator dependent is is because people are getting a picture of things, but they're not a perfect picture, and so they're not as confident. Nerves can be very hard to see that that honeycomb uh, pattern, but I think with AI and with better technology, I just think it's going to get an increasingly better resolution at the the equipment side, but you still need the operator to have consistent training from the very beginning of learning why this is important, how to do it appropriately, and then new complications that we we haven't done a lot of nerve blocks 
last or uh, local anesthetic systemic toxicity mm -hmm. and having things ready in case some things don't go well and that you're ready to handle those those complications because anytime you go down a new path there's definitely positives but there can be some other challenges and sometimes if you inject into a vascular structure that you can have some sy systemic toxicity and so I think that there's there, there's positives and negatives to it, but I think and mostly this is going to be a very positive for our patient population, and I think our learners need to be able to use that equipment appropriately. Yeah. Yeah. Great. No, training is very critical. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are here this week because it's our emergency medicine and critical care courses, and we have a sold-out course, which has been nothing but fun. Um, stressful, busy, but <laughs> fun. Uh, but we see oh, it's such a wide variety of participants come through our door, people who have never held a transducer before, to people who have over 200 of exams worth of experience, and every single one of them walk away from the program learning something. Because I just feel like ultrasound has so many things that you can learn and so many ways that you can integrate it into your clinical practice that regardless of how long you've been doing it or what you've been using it for, there's always a new way to use it or a new tip or a new trick you're going to take away when you come and listen to the experts talk about it. And it's been a really refreshing experience to see the participants in hands-on and them integrating what you guys are talking about in lecture and having those aha moments. And it's exciting. But I have heard the feedback as well as I feel overwhelmed. It's so much. I'm learning so much. I, you know, I just I don't know how to go back and integrate this into my clinical practice. So for those people out there who are listening, who are our future participants, because you all know you want to be here, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what would you say to them would be a really good starting place just for a point of care ultrasound in general? What would be kind of like the one, two, three where you would start if you were going to teach somebody who'd never held a transducer before? What you do. <laughs> that's, that's what you do every day. That's what I'm asking. That's a big question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Big um, question. I mean, it starts out just learning how to hold the probe, what certain motions mean when we're communicating so we can all use the same language and understand if I tell you to do this, you know what I'm telling you to do. Um, and then I guess just once you're familiar with the machine, with the techniques and how to move, just getting lots and lots of practice. That's really the thing that helps anyone I've worked with. The, always the people that end up best at ultrasound are the ones that do a lot of it. Yeah. It's yeah. not they were the smartest in the class. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. It was that they were driven and they were motivated and they did a lot of ultrasound. And just through practice, they became competent to the point that it was just muscle memory to do the motions to improve the improve the image that they're trying to obtain um, or able to just know intuitively how to adjust their needle just slightly to get it so it's more visible okay. um, all, all right. of those I yeah. think yeah and we always stress you know it's like anything new that you learn the more you practice the better you get mm -hmm. the less time it takes you to do it mm -hmm. and you know we call it the friends and family plan you don't have to have a real patient to practice you can practice on yourself i know when i first learned how to do calf vein imaging i sat on a stool and scanned my calf mm -hmm. veins for forever till i felt like i you know i'm people are saying what what i don't see that you know well you have to just get your eyes tuned in to to what you're looking for and it's the same thing with nerves because nerves can be very subtle and even sometimes scanning across the nerves quicker actually helps you to see them easier mm -hmm. so it's learning new techniques that maybe you wouldn't use in another area but it's just practice makes perfect and i think sometimes people don't they're like i'm too busy i don't have time to do it i got to get from patient to patient well you don't you know just scan yourself, you know, yeah. put your forearm out there and scan your median nerve and practice identifying the structure first, then you'll be able to see it. And I, w I would say when you're doing that and when you're do doing these exams, especially when you're doing it on a patient, mm -hmm. don't focus so much on just getting the image that you're ignoring the clinical question you're trying to answer. Like getting a beautiful image that is not answering the question you're looking for is mm -hmm. what is it it's it doesn't really help um, so by keeping that question that you're trying to answer in mind it allows you to drive the exam to look for those answers right um, and 
and you just come out of that feeling like it was more useful. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I think you're absolutely correct about the practice. And I think that it was Confucius said that every journey begins with one step and you have to figure out, hey, is this going to be something that's going to be embedded into my practice? And I think that there is a, uh, every hospital that you go to in the United States, there's going to be some ultrasound equipment Mm -hmm. and and it's growing more and more. And unlike when I started in the 20th century where there was lack of resources at every stage, you can't, there are so many online resources. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the equipment price that we were just talking about, how some of the equipment back in the 20th century was almost a quarter million dollars right. to try to get a piece of equipment. And it was under lock and key under certain specialties. <laughs> well, now you can buy your own portable device. Mm-hmm. And what I try to tell my learners 100 years from now, I would love to see where CT is scan is going to be as far as radiation, but I think ultrasound is going to be there. So it starts with your interest, and then there's ways to then grow that interest, and it's looking into the body, whether you're looking at a nerve or looking at the heart or looking at a lump that you don't know what it is. This is a way for you to understand, and it's it's an application of some knowledge that if you're curious, you can learn how to do this because there are skill sets. And and it's easy as looking up some – there's so many videos and online Mm -hmm. resources that – it can really decrease that learning curve, but it does not eliminate it. And you're going to have to do what's called deliberate practice. Right. Anders Ericsson talked about that. It took 10,000 hours. And I think Malcolm Gladwell talked about to become an expert. But I don't know if you need 10,000 hours in all these different areas. It's just trying to show that interest and then finding some mentors at your institution, being curious. And it's a lot easier to learn in 2023 ultrasound and so many resources than there has been yeah. ever. Right. So nerve blocks are just this natural evolution of how we can use this to help our patients. But be clear that the ultrasound helps our patients on a daily basis, and we can help them even more. Right. And I think that that opioid epidemic is still present, even though this change in the guidelines is important. We need five or ten years to try to get more, because people are in pain, and we need to treat that mm-hmm. somehow. Pain is real. Yeah. Right. But opioids were not the best method, but we don't need to go away that we just avoid opioids, because they right. do have a purpose. But there's other things in kind of having a multi-pronged approach on how to treat patients' pain. But right. it's important, and I think that... Uh, People can learn ultrasound, but it's going to take a, a process that you have to show that initial curiosity and then go through that process of practicing. So Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great summary of of what we've been talking about. And it's definitely uh, ultrasound guided nerve blocks is definitely an area where everyone that's involved with patients that are in pain should be show some sort of interest and, and take yeah. the initiative to learn because it's, it is just gonna be for the improvement of your patient care and uh, to help with pain because a lot of people are in pain and they come to you. <laughs> you see them have. on a day-to-day basis and you're busy, but you, you know how to do it and somehow you figure out how you're going to integrate that in to, to, because we do hear that too. You know, I'm so busy, I don't have time to, to do a nerve block when I've got all these other patients. That was just a question yesterday during my <laughs> lecture. They said, how am I going to integrate this in my clinical practice? Like, how realistically am I going to do this? And I said, you're going to listen to multiple physicians who do it every day, and you're going to ask them that question. You're going to say, (laughs) how am I doing this? And that's what we've been teaching them these three days is how to integrate this. It's not a all at once and you're just completely changing your practice, but it's baby steps every day. And one of the things I said is when you have a positive finding that you normally would have ordered a CAT scan for and you did order that CAT scan and you got it back and it's positive, go scan that patient. While you're delivering that diagnosis, grab your ultrasound and go scan it so that you know what it looks like on ultrasound. So appendicitis is a great example of that. You get that CT back, you're gonna go in that room, you're gonna tell them what's going on, bring your ultrasound probe. And what does that do for patient satisfaction? To have you walk in the room, put a probe on them, show them what you're talking about, right? It's Mm -hmm. huge. So it's just, people are wondering, how am I integrating this? Well, it's it's like, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. (laughs) It takes time, but baby steps, right? So, yeah, yeah, I think. Do you guys have anything to add to that right. side of things? Like, how, when you first started using ultrasound, how were you feeling? Did you feel overwhelmed? 
Well, when I first started using ultrasound, I was a resident, so every day I felt every overweight. day. Yeah. Overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but shy. not, but not by ultrasound <laughs> specifically. And you know, when people ask, "How can I find time to do this when I'm so busy?" How, how much time does it take to spin your wheels while you don't know what's going on with a patient? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. you, right. Just because you're doing a different task doesn't mean that it's more work. Mm-hmm. You might be doing less work right. because you did that task. Regional anesthesia, perfect example of how sometimes I do less work by doing this ultrasound. So rather than sedating someone for a procedure, say I have someone with a shoulder dislocation, mm-hmm. I want to I want to reduce them. I can sedate them or I can provide regional anesthesia. If I want to sedate them, I'm going to talk to five people trying to set up a team to run the regional anesthesia. Then we're going to get them all together and take that time of trying to figure out the logistics of that. And then just getting regional anesthesia, I'm sorry, the sedation going and watching until the end of the sedation. I can grab an ultrasound machine. I can do the block, go take care of another patient for a little bit, give that block a little time to work, walk back into the room and pop that shoulder in with almost no time taken. It mm-hmm. saves a ton of time. Like, That's did, I, did I do more work by doing that? I'd argue no. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good point. That's Different work. Point. Great example. Yeah, that's a great, <laughs> great example. example. This is a little bit of a challenge because what people are experiencing, and there's a lot of burnout and there's a lot of challenges by healthcare providers trying to provide care. And I love the concept that it's not the individual because you blame them for burning out versus they talk about moral injury. It's a little bit controversial, but the system is challenging. And so they're busy. And so I think that you know, if we're really dedicated to patient care, that there needs to be some collaboration between multiple specialties on trying to say this is the best for the patient and so that we're, and that there's systemic things rather than it's up to the individual to try to change the system to try to do nerve blocks at an institution. Perhaps the anesthesiologist and the surgeons and the emergency physicians and family practitioners can work together and learn in this skill because it's going to be the best for the patient. So it's a, it's a challenge because I think that all people are busy and you're trying to say, hey, put another thing that you mm-hmm. have to learn and go yeah. do this mm-hmm. um, but I think that it's it's hard when people are in the day-to-day and trying to take the long view but I really think that regional anesthesia has a lot of legs I was talking to Dr. Arun Negdev who was one of the pioneers in this in emergency medicine and he was saying how everybody was saying this is this there's no room for this in emergency medicine but he persevered and now it's now become one of the core competencies mm-hmm. and so some people will say this is not worthwhile or so forth but I think it's from my experience and with pain it's not going to go away this is another opportunity something else in our armamentarium to help treat this uh, to treat this epidemic but I but for the individual it's real where they're challenged by trying to figure out how to navigate the, the complexities and the busyness that they already have and put in something else and that's where I think systems should get behind this rather than just yes. individuals yes. health systems should say this is a priority yes. and try to do that so to try to make it easier for those providers but really important uh, jump in emergency medicine to put this under the core and I think it's really going to help patient care uh, but there's more to do in this area yeah well that's it great. being put on that core list moves it from individual to systems oh, yeah. right right yes, definitely. right that's what we needed is we right. need Definitely. that support of our of our ASAP and of our backing societies to say this is important let's make this a, co- a core competency because that's what changes systems not individuals right exactly. so I am glad to see that yeah. as well and Absolutely. it's um we have four individuals who are attending together for this course and their system said this is important. We want to, you to learn this. We want to support you in learning this. What do you need? They said, we need a course. We need a system and we need a course. They not only got a system, they got five systems hmm. and they got the course. So they're here for the week with us. Good. They're having a great time. And they were just ecstatic today and hands on to be here and be learning doing that. this together and learning That's it. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. So it is important to have your system yeah. behind you. And I for, agree with yeah. that. And for those of you listening, we have dedicated emergency medicine nerve block courses. Yep. And so you can spend a full day with us and we do upper and lower and have lots of fun. And trunkle. Like yep. And trunkle. Yep. We get it all in there. Yep. We do. It's a fun day. It's a fun day. And yep. you can lead it with ultrasound guided vascular access so you get your needle technique down. That's right. So we have it all. Yep. 
Well, it's been a great conversation. I mean, Lori and I sat down and we looked at the um, new integrated ASAP guidelines together. We made some major changes to our mm-hmm. schedule for next year, mm-hmm. which we're excited about. So yeah. if you have been thinking about attending a Gulf Coast Ultrasound Emergency Medicine Critical Care course, January 2024 is the time to come. Absolutely. It's a great new agenda, a great new plan. All the gentlemen in this room were a part of that. So thank you guys for your feedback, your input on that. Um, it was a painstaking process, but we wanted to really focus on the ASAP guidelines and how we could maximize making sure we are hitting all of those core competencies for our participants. So right. we are very excited about that new schedule yeah. and that new itinerary for next year. Yeah. So, and you can do it. Yes, you can, you do, can it. do it. You can do it. What did you sure. say in your lecture the other day about attitude, the three things? Well, competency is attitude, knowledge, and skill. And it's not knowledge and skill. When you look at everybody that's excellent, it's really the attitude that you got to believe. If you don't believe, then you're never going to do something. So you have to believe that you can do it. And this is something that people can do. Yeah. But it, it takes some practice. Right. Yeah. It takes a little right. bit of feeling uncomfortable for a day or two. Mm-hmm. Right. You can do it, and you can make a huge difference. In and your, we can help. Your patient satisfaction <laughs> and your care, right? Yeah. So, yeah. well, thank you, guys. We're so yes. happy to have you here for this week's course. But um, also, we appreciate you talking with us today about nerve blocks and the utilization of ultrasound guidance and the emergency department and hopefully our listeners are are learning a lot and will become motivated to to learn more so they can integrate it into their clinical practice as well yeah all right well we thank you guys for listening as always we appreciate your support of our channel and you can subscribe to our socials so you never miss an episode and happy scanning that's right thank you thank you Thanks for listening to the Sonography Lounge. Don't forget, if you like this episode, please subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also find us on Instagram, at Sonography Lounge, and Twitter, at Sonography LNG. If you have any questions, comments, or topic suggestions, feel free to send an email to us at sonographylounge at gmail.com. Have a great week and scan, scan, scan.